Thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. Um, my name is Stefan O'Grady. I am the senior probate and trust litigation attorney at NM Law. And we're gonna spend about 20 to 25 minutes together this afternoon discussing probate and trust contests. So let me share my screen and we can get right into this. So let's get right to it. What is a probate and trust contest? So in my practice, as I indicated, I litigate matters brought in the trial courts in California, which involve uh, matters under the probate code and California's welfare and institutions code. And I would say 80 to 90% of those matters involve contests to the validity of a will or a trust or to both. Frequently, my clients are the fiduciary. Well, what's the fiduciary? The fiduciary is the nominated executor under a will who files a petition with the probate court to be appointed as the administrator of a state. And then they're the individual responsible for administering the gifts under a will to the beneficiaries. Or the fiduciary, when it comes to a trust, is the person occupying the office of the trustee, the person nominated by the settlor, a settlor is the person that creates the trust to distribute the trust estate to the trust beneficiaries upon the passing of the settlor. Um, so those persons will come to me if there is a challenge to the validity of the will or trust and ask that I represent them in their capacity as the fiduciary to protect the will or the trust or, or both from a challenge. Vice versa, individuals will come to me and indicate that you know, they have been disinherited as a beneficiary under a will or a trust, that they believe the circumstances under which they were disinherited is suspicious and that they would like to be able to challenge the validity of the testamentary instrument because they do not believe that the will or the trust represents the true testamentary intent of the person that created the document. So there are generally, regardless of it's if the challenge to a will or the challenge to a trust, three common areas of uh, challenge. The first is that the person that created the will or the trust lacked the requisite testamentary capacity to do so. Uh, we'll get into the differences uh, in the required testamentary capacity to execute a will versus a trust in a couple of minutes. But suffice it to say, if you don't understand what you're doing, you don't understand the fact that you are creating a will or trust, then more than likely you do not have the required testamentary capacity to create the document. The second is undue influence. Undue influence is it's much more than just persuasion. You know, it's not improper for me, for example, to say to my, my mother or father, you know, I think you should leave me a gift in your trust. We've had a great relationship. I'm a loving son and I think that would be the right thing to do. It would be coercion, um, forcing my parents to leave me a gift under their will or trust against their will, um, forcing them to make decisions they would not ordinarily have made had they had the capability of warding off my undue influence. And the third is financial elder abuse. The California Welfare and Institutions Code defines an elder as a person that is 65 years of age or older and located in the state of California. As you can imagine, many of the wills and the trusts that I see in my practice that are being challenged uh, were signed by someone's age 65 years of age or older. Um, it's very common for people to create their wills and their trust later in life. So let's talk about testamentary capacity. And let's talk first about the necessary testamentary capacity um, to create a will in California. So the test to determine whether someone has a uh, has the requisite testamentary capacity to create a will in California is set forth in probate code section 6100.5. It is a very low standard, as you will see. 
simply the person that is creating the will needs to understand the fact that they are creating a will and that they are signing a will. They need to understand, secondly, the nature of the property that they own. And third, they need to understand their relationships to their living descendants or more commonly what are referred to as their heirs. So if I'm creating a will and I understand only that I am creating a will, that I have property and I understand the property that I own and I understand my relationship to my heirs, then I will be deemed in California to have had the requisite testamentary capacity to execute my will. Again, it's, it's a very low standard. Um, trusts are a different animal. Uh, the testamentary capacity necessary to execute a trust in California is more akin to the capacity required of an individual to contract. So it's not simply sufficient that I understand that I'm creating a trust, understand the property I own, and understand my relationship to my heirs. No, let's, let's bring all of these up. We can discuss all of them together. So, you know, I need to understand the rights and the duties and the responsibilities created by or affected by my decision to create a trust. I need to understand the probable consequences for the decision, not only to me, the decision maker, but where appropriate to the persons affected by my decisions. You know, in most cases, we're discussing here the beneficiaries of the trust. And I need to understand as a settlor the risks, the benefits, and the reasonable alternatives involved in my decision. So here we're talking about understanding the pros and the cons of the decision that the settlor is making to create a trust. You know, is my trust likely to be the subject of a challenge by one of the beneficiaries when I pass or someone I am disinheriting? Um, you know, reasonable um, alternatives you know i may want very much for my son to take my home when i pass away but i am afraid that if i leave it to him in my trust it's going to be the subject of a trust contest so what's a reasonable alternative to that i may during my lifetime gift the home to my son or i may retitle the property from my sole and separate property to my son and I as joint tenants with rider survivorship, meaning that when I pass away, my son is going to pass directly to my son outside of the trust. Therefore, that distribution is not going to be subject to a trust contest. So again, much more involved, a, a much more stringent um, test for capacity. Um, it, it's not, again, simply not sufficient to know only that I'm creating a trust, that I own some property, and uh, what my relationship is to my heirs. Uh, much more involved uh, test. So that's testamentary capacity. Let's move on now to undue influence, you know, which I brief briefly discussed um, previously. But undue influence, if you're interested in the um, legal definition, is set forth in California Welfare and Institutions Code section 15610.70 let me let me just bring all of these up and um, we can discuss all of these so what are courts going to look at to determine whether or not someone is the victim of undue influence where well, they're going to look at the vulnerability of the victim you know uh, is the person that was unduly influenced incapacitated ill suffering a disability, um, physically injured, um, you know, are they an elder, uh, impaired cognitively, uh, isolated, uh, and dependent on others? Um, what's the influences of parent authority? For example, are they a fiduciary? Someone in the you know, a fiduciary duty is the utmost duty under the law in California akin to the relationship between a parent and child. You know, again, family members, uh, care providers, health care professionals, legal professionals, spiritual advisors. Um, and three, the actions or tactics used by the influence, um, controlling necessaries of life, withholding care, use of affection, intimidation, coercion. Um, you know, let me give you a very um, 
common scenario for undue influence in the situation where someone is being taken care of by a caregiver, oftentimes for many years. You know, this person's children may live out of state. Uh, really, the only person they see on a day-to-day -day basis is their caregiver. You know, the caregiver is in charge of their necessar necessaries of life. Um, they provide the care and can withhold the care if they choose. They may feign affection, friendship, and love for this person. Um, you know, they may use intimidation. They may say to this person, you know, without me, you will not be able to survive. If I were to pack my bags and, and leave today, you're going to die. You know, you should thank me by leaving me a gift in your trust. You know, obviously that is using that a person's authority and their control over this person's necessaries of life to force them to make a decision that they would not ordinarily have made had they not been the victim of undue influence. And the financial elder abuse, you know, what is financial elder abuse? Uh, the definition, as I said previously, is someone um, who is in the state of California and they're aged 65 years of age or older. And so financial elder abuse involves the taking, the secreting, the appropriating and obtaining and retaining the real or personal property of an elder. Um, financial elder abuse can also be found by those who assist in the taking, secreting, appropriating, obtaining and retaining the real or personal property of an elder. And here's where we see a great tie-in between financial elder abuse and undue influence. If you are found to have taken uh, have taken, secreted, appropriated, and obtained and retained the real or personal property of an elder by undue influence, um, then you can also be found guilty of financial elder abuse. So you know, going back to the hypothetical that we discussed in the last slide, if, for example, I am the caregiver of someone who is 70 years of age, uh, I know that that person relies on me for everything. You know, and I use isolation. I keep them separated from the people that they love. I restrict their visitations with those persons. I monitor their phone calls, uh, all to gain an advantage to be able to convince them to leave me a gift in their trust when they ordinarily would not have done so. Then I have used undue influence to commit financial elder abuse. Um, again, undue influence and financial abuse in probate and trust contests do frequently go hand in hand. So common scenarios, um, you know, I'll put up two um, here, but let me, I'll just, you know, give you a couple of uh, minutes to read both to yourself and then we can um, discuss them. Okay, so these are, they're not only common scenarios, these are fact patterns taken directly from cases that I, um, I have had in the past. The first is extremely um, common in areas of blended families. So, you know, a wife and husband have been married for years, have adult children of their own, wife passes away, and husband remarries. He remarries a woman who has adult children of her own from a prior marriage. The husband um, becomes sick with terminal cancer and wife becomes his sole caregiver, very similar to the fact pattern that we discussed previously with the caregiver. Um, wife then uses that position to convince husband um, to change his trust entirely, to leave everything to her, and when she passes to her adult children, leaving nothing to his biological children. You know, obviously, had husband not been the victim of second wife's undue influence at a time when he was suffering from terminal cancer, when she was his sole caregiver, she could use her authority to isolate him, uh, restrict his phone calls with his own children, um, prevent visitation, make husband believe that without second wife's care, he would pass away. You know, she used all of those elements 
to convince him to change his trust to his detriment and to his biological children's de detriment, but to the benefit of second wife and all of her children. Again, very, very common fact pattern. Uh, second one, again, something I routinely see, husband and wife um, prepare a trust, leaving their entire trust estate equally to their two children. Uh, the um, Both children are nominated as co-trustees, meaning that they are required to make decisions regarding the administration of the trust jointly. And then after wife dies, um, number of years go by, husband becomes uh, diagnosed with dementia. Um, because daughter lives out of state, um, it's agreed husband will move in with son, at which point son uses husband's dementia to convince him that, you know, daughter is bad, daughter lives out of state, daughter doesn't take care of you, you live with me, I'm the only one that loves you, I'm the only one that cares for you, um, without me you would die, you know, uh, you know, and husband relies on these statements because he is cognitively impaired, because he is suffering from dementia, he buys into what son is saying, and he changes his trust entirely to leave, leave everything to son and removes her as co-trustee. Very, very common fact patterns that um, I see a lot in my practice. So how do we prove or disprove the validity of a will or a trust? So these are things that I look for when I am trying to determine whether or not there is a viable case to either ch to challenge the validity of a will or a trust. Um, people you know, will come to me, they will say, I have been disinherited under my parents' trust. I don't understand why. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Um, I think, you know, they've left everything to my brother. Um, you know, let, you know, there are some things I'm going to key in on. Um, you know, first, what type of medication was the person taking at the time they amended or revoked the will or trust? You know, were they taking drugs like Aricept, which are anti-dementia medications? You know, that would indicate to me that this, this person at the time they, uh, change their trust, may not have had the requisite testamentary capacity because they may have been suffering from dementia. Um, you know, what are, what's the timing of the amendments or the revocation of the will or trust? If these were done at or near the time of someone's passing, um, there is often a very strong indication there that they are the subject of undue influence or certainly that they were done at a time when someone lacked the requisite testamentary capacity to be able to make a change to their will or trust. Um, frequent changes to estate planning documents. You know, this is an indication that a person may be suffering from cognitive deficiencies because they are continually changing their trust documents back and forth, back and forth. Um, they may not remember that the, they have made changes um, they may see the changes they've made and say, I didn't intend to do that. That's not what I want. They'll change the document back to the way it was before. Uh, frequent changes also may mean that they are the victim of undue influence, that someone is using coercion and trying to get them to make decisions against their own free will to make changes to their trust. Um, you know, these can, again, I have seen instances where in the span of two years, Someone suffering from dementia made uh, eight changes to their trust over the course of two years. It's a, it's a strong indication um, that something is not right. Um, again, settlers' relationship at the time of the amendment or revocation of the will or trust. You know, is the settlor an elder being taken care of by a caregiver, and the changes to the will or trust favor the caregiver to the detriment of their biological children or their spouse. Now, that's a good indication that something is wrong. The relationships are a very key indicator um, uh, regarding whether or not uh, amendments or revocations of wills or trust are the subject of financial elder abuse or undue influence. 
um, again, the level of care provided by one child versus another, you know, as we discussed in the prior slide, um, daughter lived out of state, uh, son was solely responsible for taking care of dementia, uh, dad with dementia, used that fact to coerce dad um, and make decisions against his own free will and which does not represent dad's true testamentary intent. The level of isolation at the time of the amendment, uh, revocation of will or trust, frequently in these types of cases, changes are made to a trust, whether by amendment or revoked, um, when the person has been isolated from their loved ones, when the person that is trying to unduly influence them to make such changes is preventing them from speaking with their loved ones on the phone, is not allowing visitation with their friends, is making the settler of the trust believe that the only person in their life that cares for them is the undue influencer. Um, level of ambulation at the time of the amendment or revocation of the will or trust. You know, I have a case at this point in time where amendments were made to a trust by a person that could not walk without the assistance of a wheelchair or walker. Um, and of course, the caregiver was the person in charge of how frequently they, they left the house in their wheelchair. What was their access to their walker? Again, these are very not clear indications of undue influence, financial elder abuse, but certainly uh, things that you look at to determine whether or not be certain behaviors um, uh, could indicate undue influence or financial elder abuse. Um, evidence of addiction um, at the time the amendment or revocation of the will or trust is made. I had a case in the past where a settlor made significant changes to their trust at a time when they were addicted to opioids and other very serious painkillers that were being provided to them by, you guessed it, a caregiver and in whose favor the will or trust was changed. So again, not an exhaustive list of things that I look for, but certainly each of these are very good indicators that perhaps there is a basis upon which to challenge the validity of a will or trust. So thank you very much. That's all the time we have together today. Um, I am very happy right now to take any questions you have, um, provide you uh, whatever answers uh, I'm able to do in the, the, the amount of time we have left. Um, the phone number here to the office, 949-253-0000. Um, my email, stefan at mintocounselors.com. Uh, you know, I invite you to call me or to email me with any other types of questions um, you may have regarding probate and trust contests in California. Obviously, there is so much more that I was unable to cover in the time we had. And um, I'm a bit of a geek for this area of law. It, it, it's it's my favorite area. Um, I've never practiced another area of law which has intrigued me as much as um, probate and trust law. And I'm very happy to impart my experience and my knowledge um, on any of you at any time um, and to provide you perhaps with some insight uh, in litigating your own cases that you may not have thought of. So again, thank you very much. Um, my name is Stefan O'Grady and again, uh, it was a privilege to be able to speak with you this afternoon. Bye-bye.